Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Lean In session here at the Australian Institute of Architects. It's great to have you with me. I'm Michael Linke, and um, we're really excited today because today's Lean In focuses on the art and the science of architectural lighting. As we know, lighting has the ability to change our environment and the way that we feel within the space, bringing emotional value to architecture and helping to create a really strong experience for those of us who occupy it. And I suppose vision is one of the most important senses in the way that we enjoy architecture and lighting really strongly enhances the way that we perceive it. So in today's Lean In session, I'm thrilled to have Adam Deguara and Faye Greenhouge of Glowing Structures. Glowing Structures is an award-winning Melbourne architectural lighting consultancy firm. And they're going to showcase the critical importance of lighting across different architectural settings and share their recent lighting projects with us. And I'm really thrilled to have Adam and Faye with us. Thanks, Michael. Thanks uh, to the AIA for having us today. Um, Faye Greenhouse and Adam Deguara, um, we are running a... Um, Creative Design Studio here in Melbourne, um, Glowing Structures. Um, glowing Structures, we formed Glowing Structures about 12 years ago. Um, I've personally been doing lighting for about 25, 26 years, showing my age. Um, but uh, yeah, I fell into lighting after doing an interior design degree at RMIT. Um, I just felt the importance of lighting and the impact it has on spaces how you, and how you can transform a space with the touch of a button, literally. Uh, was really important um, and just bridging the gap with between interior designers, archi architects, landscape designers and the engineers because we often found that there was a bit of a stumbling block, block between the two um, mediums. Um, spent seven or eight years in London um, and since then coming back set up Glowing Structures and we do work all around Australia, overseas. Um, today, I'm just going to let Faye have a bit of a chat, sorry. <laughs> Uh, my name is Faye Greenhalgh. Um, I've worked here in Glowing Structures for five years now. Um, I originally started um, similar to Adam, a little bit different. Uh, electrical engineers got thrown in at the deep end. Um, my love of architectural history is probably what has dominated my career in lighting. I've been lucky enough to light such projects as uh, Westminster Abbey and some... Um, heritage buildings here in Melbourne, luckily. Um, I think we're lucky. I'm one of those really annoying people that wake up every morning. I think we all are in this office that enjoy our jobs, the passion we have for lighting. Hopefully we'll be able to get some of that across to you guys today. And um, yeah, yeah. Talk about not just our projects, but um, the effects and how to implement light and um, yeah, just impart some of our knowledge and share it. Yeah, I think it's just, there's an opportunity with lighting. I mean, we try and use lighting to embellish spaces, um, reinforce the architecture and interior design. Um, huge amounts of money is spent on surfaces and finishes and structures, um, and without lighting them, um, you know, you don't get to reveal the true um, potential of the space. The image that you can see right now is a staircase at RAC in Cape, Cape Shank. Um, as you can see, there's no downlights. Lighting isn't the feature. The architecture is the feature. We've concealed the lights to accentuate the uh, interior design. So, um, not a single downlight. We hate downlights, and you'll see that. Um, so, our general approach is quite different. We try and minimise downlights and integrate lighting in the architecture. So, um, we hope you enjoy the, the show, the experience, and um, feel free to send any questions through. Um, yeah, so we'll proceed to the next slide. Um, these are just a few topics we'll be covering. We don't want to talk about specific projects, but uh, we've got images to back these up. So um, a couple of things about highlighting architectural features, as Adam just said, are one um, constant aim in every project is to highlight any specific features, whether it be a wall treatment, flooring, artwork, even a library um, with the shelving. That's what we try and do first. Um, down lights, we'll go through that again, just lighting, putting down lights in just to light the space does not work. Um, we can't light air just by lighting the features and the walls and wash using light in a different way. We can cut down on lighting and costs ultimately as well. Um, perception, contrast and drama. Again, going into dark spaces, where do you need the light? how it's perceived, so not, you can have a ton of light in a space but actually not perceive the uh, area to be well lit. Um, 
working next thing, working with the clients and the space, every single project is different. Every area has to be treated in its own individual right. Um, right. And the lighting has to reflect that. Um, one space, various lighting treatments, you can have one room and have different color temperatures, different lighting effects, we'll go through that. Big contentious topic, uh, mixing color temperatures. Um, it can be done and it can be done to great effect. Um, and daylighting effect, I think it's something that probably comes up quite a lot, especially days like today, a bit of a gray dull day in um, Melbourne here. And everybody wants that element of daylight within a project. So they're just a few of the small topics we'll be covering today. Next slide, please. Um, so the forum was a project we were very fortunate to, to um, be involved in. It's probably, I always refer to it as the Disneyland project. It's one in, once in a lifetime, so to speak. Um, the potential was amazing. Um, and we'll be showing some before and afters. But uh, as you can see just from this image here, we've implemented, obviously, a heritage listed building. Um, we've implemented some contemporary techniques that concealed them um, so that it embellishes the architectural detail. Um, I think it's going on from what Adam's saying. So this lobby just had huge general downlights in there before. We removed all the uh, standard downlights. We'll go into that a little bit more. So this is the doors, the secondary doors that lead you into the actual um, theatre space. And they weren't lit or highlighted. So when you got in the, for, uh, the foyer, which is double height, it was a bit confusing. There's quite a lot. If anybody's been in the forum, there's a lot going on in there. And the doors weren't highlighted. So, you know, we look at the space and try and work out where you need people to go and also highlight the features. So the doors have these amazing, crazy features around them. So we just illuminated them and there's not much else going on around there apart from the doors being lit. And it works, it highlights the features, it provides general light into the space, but also it's a usable public space and it gets the people where they need to be. Next slide, please. This is a before and after shot. Um, we'll, get in, we'll get into color. <laughs> I think, I think it's quite obvious the difference. Um, we'll get into the color temperature and whatnot. Obviously with lighting, there are many aspects from a technical perspective, um, which change the space. Um, originally, the image on the left shows the uh, before photo where it was just cool white light. It does nothing to the actual fabric of the interior. Um, it's all flat, it's two dimensional. There's no perspective or dimension. Um, what we try to do with the lighting is not like everything. It's really important to pick the pieces that you like. Um, have focal points. Obviously, the stage is the focal point. This is the backdrop, you know, between sessions and whatnot. Um, getting that color temperature, something you're going to hear quite often in, in this, and as designers and architects yourselves, getting the color temperature really emphasizes the materials and, and finishes that you um, select. Um, but, yeah, we've obviously used a warmer, color temperature to complement as a, literally the negative of the blue skylight, which reinforces the other. Um, also, just going on from what Adam was saying, the blue's quite domineering and uh, they wanted to keep that part of the heritage of the forum is this blue ceiling. Um, and if you've just got the blue on its own, it can be very domineering. And as you probably all well know, the blue light does not make people look the best. And seeing as this is a, a function venue as well, um, we tested quite a lot of um, complementary colours. So this colour that's um, shown now really complements the blue and offsets the actual heritage architecture that's in the space. Next slide, please. This is just showing, um, again, instead of just putting lights to light the space, we highlighted, picked out a few focal points and highlighted those. And we didn't light the whole space. We just picked out windows, candelabras, and the lovely Roman statues at the top, which um, maybe, or maybe not a heritage. <laughs> um, so it's a bit, a bit of fun. We just created a bit of fun with this area. It's funny, we were lighting the statues. We mocked it up with the client. Um, and the statues framing the stage, um, we were uplighting them at one stage. We saw that it revealed certain parts which we probably couldn't, shouldn't be publicizing, so we got rid of that. We backlit that person, that male to the left of the screen. Um, but as much as lighting is really important, 
the shadow is really important. And you can see in the background, we have the silhouette of um, the structure behind. Um, if we lit that as it was previously floodlit, it would have reduced that depth in the space. Um, so sometimes shadow is just as important as lighting itself. Next slide, please. This is just showing the overall effect. Um, I think the stage um, should be the main focal point, but this venue is used for different functions. There's, there's a new bar that was put in on the right hand side, uh, beautifully designed here locally by Stephen Hennessy. Um, and then the stage is one thing, but this can be used for weddings, corporate events, lots of different functions. So we had to take the usage of the space into consideration as well. Um, so there's lots of different modes we can set this space up as, whether it's a, a comedy night or a wedding, it can be used for lots of different things. Next slide, please. And this is probably a really good example of less is more. Um, this is just a little lobby outside one of the uh, toilets. Um, no downlights. We didn't want to ruin the interior and the fabric of the ceiling structure. Um, there's a couple of uplights to the fireplace and there's some very discreet downlights just providing adequate illumination, just creating mood, accentuating the architecture and the, the, the heritage details. It's more than enough for the space. Next slide. Um, this is again just picking up on certain features around the space. So there's a lot of um, uh, statues, so we highlighted those. Um, looking at the ceiling here in the foyer, there was, um, I don't know if you can see in the ceiling, there's a tiny little pin spots of light um, that we replicated. In, um, we read the heritage brochure and there used to be a fiber optic ceiling here, which we replicated in the lighting scheme and used these tiny, tiny starlight effects to actually provide the general light and more than enough to comply with any BCA requirements. Next slide, please. The bathroom, always forgotten. Um, I think if anybody's ever got the chance to go to the forum bathrooms, it is beautiful. So the lighting was really important here, get, getting told that it has to be good uh, makeup light. So the only lighting we really put in here was really good lighting to the face. And you can see above that mirror on the right hand side, we actually put um, a linear line to the skylight. So at night time, it's almost like a daylight effect coming through. Next slide. Um, this is the lobby, different perspective. Uh, again, the idea of, um, so you can see in the, in the ceiling, the star constellation, that was a, a existing fiber optic system. Uh, the client did advise us that uh, there were issues, you know, they wanted to illuminate the stairs adequately or to standard just to make sure that uh, obviously it's a safe passage. Um, so we, what we actually did was we found a very discreet um, concealed downlight, which we formulated into the ceiling space and concentrated some of them over the um, staircase, so it provided more than enough illumination and it, and it blended in with the star constellation. So um, again, just for, a little bit of forward planning and thinking um, can achieve some amazing results as part of the architecture. So this blue was in here before, but it was very domineering. Um, and we added the soft light to light down the freeze around the top. And it also offsets the blue. So um, the blue had to stay. So we had to find a way of working with that and to maybe tone it down and make it a bit of a more of a, a friendlier space. As you can see at the bottom of the image, that the doors are one of the high, the columns to the right of um, highlighted. First thing we would like we like to use lighting as a wayfinding um, tool. So as soon as people walk into that space, they naturally gravitate towards the bright and slick thing, which is where they're supposed to be heading. So um, lighting can be a, an informal way of guiding people through spaces. Next slide. Uh, this is probably sh just showing um, how uh, little light we have in here by highlighting. The, so this scene. Um, segments called architecture first, lighting the architecture first. So on the left hand side showing the ground floor lighting plan, there's hardly any light there. Um, we literally have the existing lanterns and the up lights to the walls and that's it. The second plan along shows the tiny 28 mil diameter down lights that are being used to create the starry sky and that is it. And you can see there's more than enough light. Not only is there more than enough light, we can change this by the touch report with the control scene, depending on what's happening in there. So they sometimes have functions actually in the foyer, 
so we can make it all um, quite a moody cocktail scene, right up to clean scene at the touch of a button. Next slide. Um, the abode um, on Russell Street is a project we got in, introduced to quite late in the piece. Um, um, essentially, we picked up a design by others, um, which was fine, it was functional, it would have done the job. Um, however, it was well over budget. Um, we were introduced, first thing we did is ditch the downlights. Um, as you can see from the, uh, this image here, we concentrated the lighting onto the surfaces. I mean, quite a good deal of money was spent on the, the uh, stone walls and this infinity wall. So we lit that. There's two downlights over the coffee table just to create that accent focal point in the space. Um, I think our fee was you know, in the order of $30,000 for the project and by us coming in and getting involved, I think we saved in the order of about $320,000. So just by rationalizing, you've got a much cleaner interior space, um, much more inviting space, less um, costs in terms of purchasing, installation and maintenance. So it was win, win, win all the way around. Next slide. It's the same project, again, just enhancing the architectural elements um, and minimise, just consider incorporating the light in the interior space. Next slide. Carried that through throughout the whole development. Um, obviously, the, the public spaces, this was the pool. We just integrated the lighting and cove details and trough details and whatnot. No lighting over the pool. Obviously, you've got this barrel cell, beautiful barrel cell ceiling. We didn't, A, want to um, penetrate that. And B, it's impossible to maintain. So uh, we kept all the lighting for the open space. So the lighting here is going from the side, so it's highlighting the ceiling. So all that light that's on the ceilings left and right of the pool is from the sides and integrated into the sides of the barrel The pool is lit by the pool lights, all that's needed. And again, like Adam said, I think we took out quite a few existing down lights in that space. Quite a few is probably. Uh, I think we stripped about 95% of the downlights on that were previously designed for the project. And there was ones over the pool, <laughs> which uh, no one wants to uh, maintain. Next slide, please. Same thing, just carrying the same philosophy throughout the, um, the front of house spaces. Next slide. Again, um, <laughs> we're kind of showing what not to do. Again, we stripped out all the downlights. We, we didn't need so many downlights in this space. It's just a casual um, lounge space. There is lots of light, as you can see, to the green wall. It wasn't designed by us, um, but green walls are a bit of a fallacy. Um, they're not green at all, because you can see how much light and how much energy is required to keep a green wall alive. So uh, as much as people want to put a green wall in for environmental perspectives, when you look at the technical side of things, they're not very green. We'll discuss this more later on. Next slide, a hot please. topic. And um, this is just going back to the lobby. So that image there is looking to the west of those um, plans right there. The top right hand plan is our um, reduced plan. The plan on the bottom right, we probably should have cleaned it up, it's not fair, there is all the services in there, but I think it can clearly show the amount of downlights that were originally proposed throughout that space compared to what we put in, again Adam's talking about, you know, there's a lot of money being put in this stone and the infinity wall behind the um, sofa, so that was highlighted, so don't put the downlights, you cannot light air, the more you just try and add in, you're just going to light the top of your head when you walk through it. So the top plans as installed, the bottom plans a previous pre pre-designed. Next, yeah. next slide, please. So ditch the downlights. Vertical surfaces are really important in spaces. They open up the space, give it a lot more depth and perspective. Um, creating drama. Again, sometimes less is more. Um, by floodlighting a space, we you lose your accents and your focal points. Um, areas that have got high ceilings, it's sometimes important even if you're just doing a wash down the wall to add a bit of intermediate lighting. So there's lighting at human level. Um, if you've got areas um, for a boat, for example, there was lounges, just the bookshelves, artwork. Um, if once you've got all these few little elements that highlights in, you do not need that much other lighting. This light will reflect into the space, create a perceived amount of light within the space without adding tons of downlight to the center.
Next slide, please. So the Royal Elizabeth Apartments again, um, budget wasn't huge for a developer, obviously wanting to make money, not spend money, uh, but at the same time create a, a really enjoyable space for the um, for their residents. Um, so the concept behind this interior was the tree trunk or a tree natural tree scape. Um, so the tiles which were selected were had this beautiful texture to them. So lighting was vital to accentuate that. If that you use the wrong angle of light or the wrong direction of light, you would have lost all of that texture on the column and on the back walls. Um, again, cost was a concern, so this this project was designed on a shoestring budget, um, but recently we've just won a Melbourne Design Award for it. Um, I think it's a, quite a great achievement for the budget that was spent and the um, impact of the space. Um, that pendant that you see, um, was a custom design pendant. It was, for, it was to emulate the rings in the tree trunk, um, the cut tree, the sawn cut tree trunk. Um, so we just picked out little elements indiscreetly to um, light the space, but reinforce the concept. Next slide. This really shows as you're coming into the space. I mean, you can see the darkness um, and the actual lack of downlight. So the place is, all the finishes are black and dark. By right? adding lots and lots and lots of light does not work. Um, but if you do add lots and lots of light, actually the term contrast can be a negative one. So if you've got a dark space and you add a lot of light in one area, that one area can seem really, really bright. And one area that's perfectly well lit can seem dark. So when you've got areas that are, um, darker a lot you've got to pay a lot more attention to the lighting and maybe it has to be a little bit more even so the idea behind the pendant and the tree trunk here is also a wayfinding so it provides a general light to the space you can see the even illumination across the floor but then also the light is behind the concierge and the desk is lit the it, there's wayfinding so it's about thinking how people use the space so there's plenty of light in this space and there's also wayfinding light, so the light has been put to guide people to certain areas within this lobby. Next slide. Again, just revealing texture, really important. Um, with our interior design background, um, as I said, we're bridging the gap between the engineer and you guys as designers. Um, I guess what we're professing is not that, you know, we're trying to teach you guys some techniques or um, reinforcing techniques that you yourself can do because we know architects and designers do their own um, design plans but just choosing the right type of light the right location of the light as you can see really accentuates the texture um, if that wasn't illuminated correctly you wouldn't you wouldn't be reading the texture that was always intended it's quite easily to wash out um, a highly textured surface with with the wrong lighting treatment um, so I think we'll mention it later on in here and um, testing lighting on a texture or a colour is super important. Um, obviously this wall probably didn't come from, uh, not that there's anything wrong with Bunnings, but it, it, you know, it wasn't at that price point. But it, we highlighted it to bring out the texture. It was very, very important to the clients and the designers that it, this was highlighted. Next slide. So perception, contrast and drama. Um, Bouncing light off surface is really important. Reduce the amount of light required overhead. Um, dark spaces, dark finishes are dark finishes. And obviously, that's what's been chosen, but that can be mitigated by lighting various surfaces. Um, visual accents in spaces are always really quite good. We've found a lot of our successful projects you can have a certain level of layering of light. I guess that's what we try and achieve. Um, having focal points and accent points so you don't need a blanket of light. Um, and as Faye mentioned, testing, 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 again. Um, I'm just going to cover something that happened a couple of weeks ago on a very large project. Uh, we were involved in one part. We got taken to a lobby that was all black. It was beautiful. Um, black marble everywhere. Beautiful. And there was a slot detail all washing down the wall. And the client was really concerned that the lobby was dark went in there, actually took the Lux um, meter, and the lowest area was 320 Lux, which is pretty bright. Um, it's your minimum amount for task light. Um, but because the lighting was so bright in one part, in a dark area, the contrast made everything else look 
dark. So we actually told the client to dim the lights, which he thought was crazy. Um, telling somebody who's complaining that it's too dark to dim the lights, but they did and it evened out the space and there wasn't one area in this dark corridor that was super bright and then the other part was super dark. So yeah, the whole contrast and the perception of light and the space is very important. Next slide. Um, so this is, so we do commercial spaces, obviously hospitality, heritage, blah, blah, blah. Um, private residences, this was quite challenging. Um, lots of precast concrete and off-form concrete. Um, so there was lots of planning required. Um, we find it's a lot easier, whether we're involved, another lighting, lighting design is involved or, or with your own um, designs. Um, planning ahead and coordinating with services, structures and whatnot is paramount. The sooner it gets in, the cheaper it is for, to build. Um, the, once everybody's aware of the requirements, it's just a lot easier for uh, coordination purposes. Uh, next slide. So this is just showing um, the residents. Again, obviously off form concrete, we want to minimize the use of downlight. So you can only see a, a downlight at the front door. Um, we had a trough of light in the, in the floor out externally, continuing internally to illuminate the soffit of this uh, off form concrete. Again, you know, the, um, the, the, the feature of that, this space was the uh, texture in the ceiling. So we wanted to highlight that. Um, the downlight's just providing a focal point accent at the door, so give people a sense of direction. Um, next slide. So again, um, just bringing outside into inside. Uh, we like outdoor spaces to feel like they're part of the interior, so we light them as such. You can see some external floor lanterns, obviously weatherproof, marine, uh, marine grade, blah, blah, blah. Um, but that just creates, when you open those beautiful sliding doors outside, to feel as though it's part of an inside space, and it's just an extension of the living area. It's really important outside as well to um, not overlight the space. When you go outside, it should feel magical. So it's, it's at night, it should not be lit like your internal office. Um, you should walk outside, walk away from your study, your dining room, where you've just unpacked all your shopping and feel magical. Um, people seem to think they want need down lights. That all that space is lit is with those three, four lanterns. And that's just enough. You've got wayfinding, there's enough light. Sit there and have a drink at night. Um, do not overlight the exterior at night. It should be dark and magical, like I said. And I think the client was very specific on this, weren't they? Yeah, um, they were uh, outdoor entertaining. Or yeah. This is actually being dimmed down. Um, next slide. So as much as um, obviously this lighting, the, the lighting for this space, I guess I'm going to contradict myself here. You need to make sure there's enough light or should they want to have a party or clean the house so it can't just always be moody. So this, this home has that ability. It can be a lot brighter than we're seeing now. We're just showing the sexy images. Um, you can see the outdoor lighting has been programmed with the interior lighting. So that, um, again, you know, with, with the flick of a button when they hit meals time or TV time, the out outdoor lighting comes on with the interior. So it, it's just create, opening up the space quite a lot. As, you can, as I said, you can see the off-form concrete in the ceiling. So there's lots of planning ahead required for this one. Um, so there's just a downlight over the coffee table, two downlights over the um, dining table, and some extra lighting over the kitchen. Because obviously, again, as much as we want things to look sexy and attractive, we need practical lighting. So uh, from our perspective, it needs to have both the, the ambience and the um, practicality. Um, I think the good thing about this space um, is the way Adam worked with the clients. Um, the client. I think we worked with for probably about a year before anything was implemented. And it's really important what we think works and how they use the space are two different things. So we have to take it on board, not just what looks good, but how they use the space and entertaining and indoor and outdoor was I think the main priorities here and not interrupting the actual architecture of the space. Um, the architecture was beautiful and actually where you can see the dots of light, it's just from the photo. So the, the lighting was, in, in, um, implemented behind the concrete so they're actually you can't you can't see them but the photos are showing them up yeah <laughs> thanks camera <laughs> next slide please again an absence of downlights so the client is going to say a word i shouldn't say um didn't like i was a bit concerned when they saw the plan with hardly any lights on it um 
but we reassured them that there were lights, obviously, as you can see in, in the white, in the um, cellar, up lighting the bottles, there's wines in the joinery, uh, there's the light in the joinery, um, a little pendant to the side of the lift core, um, some lighting to the artwork and a floor lamp. Um, as a safety net, we put a cable of um, supply in the ceiling should, at the client's request, should they wish to add more light, it's not necessary, it's not required. Like I said, lighting, architectural elements and features, you tend to get more than enough light and obviously being a residential space is a bit, little bit more forgiving. And I think what I like here as well, things don't always have to line up. So in, in, when we're first working on a job, we're always looking at a plan and nobody ever sees the space in plan of view. So we always think about it as people are walking through the space. Um, so if things don't line up or if they're not even, think about it from actually being in the 3D space, not from the plan. Um, so here we have one pendant to one side of the lift and an up light to the other, um, which works really nicely. It just softens the space. It creates a little bit of interest. And um, at nighttime, when they have the night scene on in this house, they dim all the wine cellar down and then you've just got enough movement light to get them to the lift. Next slide. Again, some dramatic lighting, integration of um, neon lighting, concealed lighting. This was their little theater room. Uh, and the staircase, again, fully integrated lighting. There's not a single down light. There were provisions put in the ceiling just in case. It's probably a good little point for you guys that um, if you are designing, you're a little unsure. We do it all the time. We kind of over allow. Um, put a provision, put a supply in the ceiling, put a supply in the wall. Much easier to do that during the, during the roughing in stage. Should you need it later on, you've got it there. You've got all the hard work done. But uh, this space was a really good example of not requiring it. There's some lighting in the, the uh, custom handrail detail and, and some lighting integrated at the edge of the stair uh, treads, um, up lighting the wall. Next. Is uh, one of our favorites, um, Dan Murphy cellar in Chapel Street, Fran? That's uh, so not like a normal Dan Murphy cellar. Um, really often, ask clients to go to Dan Murphy's in um, Chapel Street and they go to the one over the road and they're just like, oh, okay, that's nice. Um, nice warehouse. Yes, nice warehouse. So this is um, probably on the topic of client-specific lighting and how you have to think about the client requirements and the requirements of the space. Um, so I think we might have a video cat if, um, if it works on the Zoom, please. I think the focal point with lighting is that um, we need to use lighting as the directive element. Um, being a retail space, we want people's eye to be drawn to the products. Um, so with this, you can see in the ceiling, there's not a single downlight. Focus of the light is, sorry about the jittery, Zoom, technology, COVID, <laughs> stay at home technology. Um, the, the product is the focal point in this space. Um, we do have subtle lighting to the architecture. The architecture forms a backdrop. They're trying to sell spirits. We're highlighting them. Um, so that's where the eye should be drawn. And you use the same analogy in a hotel. As people walk into the, the hotel reception, kind of either the lounge or the reception desk is the focal point. So you use lighting to direct them to the most important piece. Um, just like Adam said, so the alcohol, if we'd have just lit the liquor, um, it, there would have been too much contrast, it's just been liquor, but there was a beautiful backdrop of this building. The bones of this building have been there since 1780 or something. It's actually where Dan Murphy's, that cellar, what you're looking at right now is where Dan Murphy started the business 60 years ago. He used to have his secret wine tasting in the <laughs> basement there, uh, where only a few people were invited. So I think the process of going through with this project was A, the heritage restrictions, um, which worked out, always work out well in the end. Um, we couldn't get any downloads. We couldn't have fixed anything to only where there was existing structure, um, older structure, that put in, uh, newer structure, sorry, they've been put in later. So Dan Murphy's were putting in this amazing joinery. It was all handmade and shipped here. So we put all the lighting within the joinery to highlight the bottles. Um, we actually went to the effort of getting very specific LED strips uh, made. So. I think on each section of shelving, there's four different LED strips, depending on whether it's backlighting, it's on an angled bottle, or if it's uplighting the straight bottle, and they're all on different circuits. So this um, also doubles up as a function center, so we can play around with the lighting a bit. But the light was 
tested. We had to buy a lot of wine to test in the office and to try and minimize any glare on the bottles. Pretty much impossible because all the labels are different so, uh, different points on the bottles. Bottles are naturally reflective, um, but we made bespoke products just for this project. So the detailing, detailing, whether it's wine bottles, shelves, mirrors, ceiling curves, what have you, detailing is obviously fundamental. Um, next slide, please. Again, that's the um, kind of uh, tasting counter, but also the, um, cert the, the cashier. Um, next slide. Some subtle liking to the um, architecture. Next slide. You don't like that one. No. <laughs> um, again, focal point is the uh, bottles, but this obviously got this waiting area to create some ambience. Next slide. Um, this shows the skylights. Um, again, we added lighting to the skylights to um, at night. There's a sense of light coming through those lights. They're there. It's not nice to have something above you that's in darkness. So we always think about areas beyond um, there. Next slide. Um, this is just talking about detailing. So this is in one set of shelving. There's up to four or five different types of shell, uh, detailing. It's really important. There was so much testing went on. Not all LED strips perform the same, whether you move them up, down, left, right, pointing backwards. So there's you. There's lots on the market. Um, get your supplies in, test them, and if it doesn't work, work. You can move it. Moving it, an LED strip 10 mil out or 10 mil back will make a huge difference. Whether it's a texture, a bottle, artwork, um, yeah, just detailing and testing. I think is the main priority. Just on one set of shelves, it, it can create a massive difference. I think one one problem we all face is uh, off speaking. Um, you guys would face it, we face it. Um, off speccing is obviously a real problem where, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we've been spent months detailing this, finding the right color temperature. Um, and often another party comes in with a cheaper alternative. Um, it's a waste of our time, waste of our fees, and the end result won't be achieved. The client will be disappointed. What we try and do to counter that is because. Um, you know, there's a 20 watt per meter LED used in some of our shelves and it's 2,800 Kelvin. Um, often the builder will go off and get another one which is the same uh, statistically or technically it's the same, uh, has the same values but every single manufacturer's, there's not enough control with LED. Every single ma manufacturer's 2,800 or 3,000 Kelvin is different. Um, so just as a little pointer, just to ensure your products don't get off spec we always ask the builder to get a sample of the alternate spec and the, the specified, the original specified fitting and hold them up next to each other and, or next to the product or next to the fabric or next to the texture that you're trying to like. Um, any client that it is trying to preserve the design that you guys are putting forward will opt for obviously the best product. And should the alternative be acceptable? Great, but often it's not. So don't let the builder or contractor bully you into an alternative which on paper has the same specification but in, in practical in practical sense it, uh, we always ask to test it and demonstrate it to the client before a decision is made so just a little point out we're all going to face it and we do face it and we will continue to face it yeah. uh, next slide please um, this is an architect's office um, in Melbourne uh, this one, um, what was that, the Australasian? Um, Herman Miller, most livable office. Um, the brief for this was to create a warm, welcoming, comfortable office space for um, obviously clients to enjoy and the staff to enjoy. Um, so we really had a hospitality focused um, drive behind this whilst ensuring there's enough light on workspaces and whatnot. So through this, we're just going to talk about how there can be one office and there's probably about 15 different uh, techniques used throughout the office. We're not going to go through them, but how you can have one open plan space and light each area differently. So we'll go through that quickly. Next up. 
So this is the entry. So the main entry of the space was um, to be welcoming, hotel lobby-like, a little bit softer. It's not a working area. Um, apart from the receptionist, she's got plenty of light, but it was more about come here, sit down, lamps, the plants are lit, um, just a little bit softer than your standard working area, welcoming area um, to the space. So the lighting treatment to this space defines that zone. So, so we use lighting treatments per zone to, as you walk through the space, you can immediately feel that you're in the front of house space, the reception space, the lounge space, the workspace, chill out space. Next slide. We love working with these guys. We don't <laughs> want to be promoting anybody to the AIA. Um, I think people may know who it is, but uh, we're neutral. Yeah, we've, we've got architects office, not the name. Um, so yes, we do love working with these guys as we do with all our architects. Um, um, so this is obviously the task area. So this had a obviously very specific um, lighting treatment. So it had to have the, we um, lit the space, but we wanted to lit, light it very differently from their old office, which had the beautiful um, suspended panel ceilings with fluorescence in them, I think. It's like going yeah. back to 1970s. So what we gave the client here is um, a scheme where you can't see the light sources. Um, so there's plenty of light on the desks. It can be ramped up, you can ramp right down. Um, but there's good task lighting to the task areas. Um, it, this is a little meeting room of the reception area. So this has got down lights, very small. Um, low glare down lights lined up perfectly with the services you can probably see in that timber ceiling there. Um, they're the size of a Lego piece, um, but they liked the surface perfectly. But we only did a decorative element in this meeting room because it was just off from the um, entry lounge area. So when we're treating these areas, we always have to think about, even though each area is treated separately, we have to think about what's beyond and what's the next part that's happening within this space and make sure they all work cohesively. Um, you can see the task area um, well illuminated to the left there. They also had these wall panels on the right hand side which were black gloss, pretty much impossible to light well. Um, but we concealed some um, wall washers, some high powered wall washers to the walls um, so they got the illumination required on the vertical surfaces. But create that cr contrast and drama we, were, we mentioned right at the start of the presentation. Um, in this space, the, the core was really well lit, so obviously the pin-up boards are, are really well lit, nice and even, um, except for a mechanical duct, which is causing a bit of a shadow, <laughs> but we won't talk about that one. Um, so the core was really well lit. There's literally no lighting over the walkway because you get so much spill light from the um, pin-up wall, and then there's lots of light over the, the desks, um, reducing power consumption, reducing initial costs, and creating contrast and drama and it gives it creates that kind of balanced lighting effect that we're after where you've got that layering of light and again there's no visual clutter so there's a lot the, the hot they um the architects took a lot of time to clean up all these um services in the ceiling we didn't want to mess it up with lighting so as you can see over the desk there's not one visual point of light there um, so we ensured that the light got to the desk, but without being able to stand there, unless you're right under looking at the light source, you can't see the lights. We didn't want all this visual clutter going on through what is quite a large open plan office. Focal points to the pin board. And that yes. Was, that, was the focus, that's that, that was the hierarchy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is the opposite entry to the reception area. So this is the locker area. Um, so the lobby, as you can see just beyond, is illuminated by the building, there was nothing we could do. Um, but we didn't want the locker area to become a secondarily forgotten place, but, so we uplit the area above the lockers. It's the light bounces around, there's plenty of light to the space, but it's just lit in a different way. We don't need task lighting here. Um, we're thinking about the usage of the space. Often um, people ask us to light lobbies similar to what's going on here. Nobody's reading small print in the lobby. They can be unusual or a little bit have more drama to them. Next slide, please. Um, this is the samples area. We've got a lot more light in here. This is their party mode actually dimmed right down. Um, so this is again thinking about the usage. They need to be able to see samples, and we use high CRI LEDs through here. 
so they can see any samples and true colours as much as possible without going to the daylight. Next. Two other areas within the office on the left is the quiet zones. So we've intentionally kept them quite dark and moody, just naturally feeling that quieter, darker light. Um, each booth has an individually controlled wall light. Uh, the image on the right shows the meeting rooms, which um, you can just about see the down lights to the table. So everything was very small, concealed, and specific to what it's lighting. So the lights are just over the meeting room tables. They're not going to be moved. So we didn't have lights to the right and the left that were just lighting the floor. It was just lighting the tables and giving more than enough illumination for any paperwork. Thanks. Um, the kitchen in this area, just again, we could just use some really interesting detailing to the shelving and create a bit of a feature. Um, if there's enough light to the worktop and it creates a little bit of a visual element to the space without, again, no down lights. I um, hate to keep repeating it, but you don't need them. We've got task light and we've got the beautiful glasses, which I'm sure are kept like that every single day, um, illuminated. So again, just thinking about maybe different tricks with lighting. Next. I guess just to summarize with the architect's office, um, lots of different treatments. There's, there's residential lighting, there's technical lighting, there's concealed lighting, there's exposed lighting. Um, there are no rules. Um, so I think projects just need to be tailored, tailored specific for each, each um, client and the use. Next slide. Um, so Jay Rabbit's a hospitality venue we designed in uh, Sydney. Go to the next one, please. Um, it's one of the biggest no-nos in the industry is mixing colour temperatures. Um, I guess, well, probably should say it. Rules are meant to be broken in that respect. We've shown a combination of cool white and warm white here. So the warm white for the gaming floor is really buzzing, as you can just imagine. This is in the casino. Um, so the, the dining space or the, the table space is quite warm. Um, but to, again. The key focal point of this space, we're using the light to accentuate the bottles. So we lit those in cool white, just to create that element of drama. Um, and lighting bottles, you get these amazing colors in bottles and spirits and labels and what have you shapes. Um, cool white is actually better for a retail environment or for the bottles. So the warm white contrasting with the cool white creates that drama that we were, the client was after. And we also considered the space around there, like Adam said, it's in the casino, it's on the casino floor. So the view from this bar for quite a lot of elements is from this way. So we pointed the light, so the view was always merging into one. So we did the colour temperatures from the floor up and from the ceiling down, so it all merged into a viewpoint in at the back of the bar there. And also there was lots of orange, I think they've got very orange decorative lights around, so we wanted to make it stand out against those. So thinking about not just that space, but when you get to that space, what are you experiencing before you get to that space? And then this is, in it's it, at the end of the day, it's a sales point. They're selling alcohol. That's what we want to highlight. It's a bar that we have to highlight the alcohol. Next. Again, just showing, showcasing the, uh, the, you know, the, the bottle display is a bit like a, the inside of a jewelry box. It's quite beautiful, sparkly. Um, and you can't help but look straight to that when you're going to order something. Um, just enhancing that, enhancing sales, which is what they're about, and making things look beautiful. Next. The seating areas actually have um, some lighting to them that are tunable. So the lighting here can be amended um, through night time. So the lighting to the people and their faces can be a lot warmer and is in direct contrast to what's happening at the bar, which is a little bit cooler. So yeah, this is a job we did with uh, Paul Kelly and, they, and Paul Kelly designed in Sydney and they had some yeah, beautiful materials mm -hmm. lighting up the counter front to the, the bar counter. Um, yeah, worked well. Next project. Next slide. Again, mixing colour temperatures, it's a big no-no, but uh, from our perspective it's a big yes, yes in the right instances. I think this um, project we've just shown you is probably really dramatic from probably 2003 right to 5,000 Kelvin. But every single project we've shown you so far has a, a mixture of different colour temperatures of whether they're just 3,000, 3 and a half and 27 just softly merged to completely different colour temperatures at the forum. Um, but it is something, it's an old rule and it is a rule that should be broken. We think. 
Yeah, in the right. In the right instance. Uh, yeah. there's, there's, there's the time and place for Next. Um, end of trip. We're seeing lots of end of trips popping up everywhere in new and existing buildings. Um, what a face. Wonderful creations. Excellent. Um, this was amazing. It was by, designed by Grove Cox, and, and I always say it would have been beautiful anyway. Um, but the detailing around this project was amazing. So it couldn't have gone wrong. It was beautiful space to start with. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, I think this is just talking around client expectations. So discussing things with the client from day one is really important. So on the left hand side was the original render. Um, we did put the square down lights and on the right hand side is the actual um, finished product um, So you can see the actual detailing is very similar um, apart from the square down lights We ensured the client that they didn't need all the down lights and with the spill light from everywhere else We managed to get enough light in the project, but there's more than enough light down there. I think we got dimmed down Yeah, this is all dimmed down the control system yeah. lots of facial lighting, which is really important So it's practical, but it was yeah, next slide same thing here, concealed lighting in the architecture, minimize the downlights. There's a couple of pin spots to the little um, um, island benches, the um, seating areas, and that's pretty much it. You know, it's just concealed lighting. Um, next slide. Just a little different treatment. So mm -hmm. lighting, a clear glossy shelf, just adding a different element in these areas is great their focal point. Next slide. Um, this was the extension to the project we've just shown you. So the one we've just shown you is very warm and ambient and welcoming hotel-like. Um, this is looking from the end of the trip into their new area, which is called uh, Rise by Studio PP, and it's actually a wellness centre. They do yoga. So uh, if you don't know this project, all this area is two storeys underground. So going into this area, what we wanted to create was daylight feeling. Um, so even though there's no light, there's no windows, there's, um, it's all about the daylight effect and front lighting. So Contentious topic. Dale <clears throat> sitting there in the foreground, interior designer doubling up as a model. <laughs> um, next slide please. So being a subterranean space, it was really important for lighting to um, create the perception that this was above ground and there was lots of natural light. All of this is underground. This is at the bottom of 101 Collins. Um, they took over parts of the car park to build this. So um, Clay, Faith and team have cleverly designed little details here to create the perception. And again, this is kind of the mixture of warm white with cool white. The cool white that you can see in the left image creates the perception of daylight. Um, and then you've got warm white in the center of the space reinforcing that contrast. Um, you obviously see the lights going through the uh, lighting the trees. There's cooler light on the trees, again, to create that perception of daylight peeping through, um, and then contrasting that with the warm light in the general space. Next slide. I think um, create with spaces, lighting, as we mentioned, we've always mentioned this, lighting perimeters and walls and ceilings which is the total opposite to what a downlight does, really um, opens up the space. Um, and I think that was fundamental in this project to get light up on the ceiling to the walls, to open up the space and uh, minimize that cave-like appearance that you usually get with spaces that are lit from above only. So this foyer has an element of greenery, white, and what we created all these elements beyond these cracks of light, these darker enticing areas that you can just see going beyond them as well. Next slide. Um, the joinery added that element of warmth where you can see direct contrast where we've got the growth lights to the plants, they're real plants that are indoors, um, creating a little bit cool area. Um, we'll talk about the growth lights a little bit later on. Next slide. Um, these, there were some beautiful skylights designed by Grey Pucks and where the bamboos grown up into. Unfortunately, we don't have any images of them because they're pretty amazing. Um, but unfortunately, just where they're, they're naturally positioned, there's no sunlight going to them. So we um, lit them with non-growth light um, lighting. So you can see the down lights here to the planting. So what we used was not the standard plant lights because the ceiling height, I think, was 2.7. To be able to get plant lights in a ceiling height, 
that low would not be pleasant for anybody using the space. So we did a little bit of research and actually used artwork lighting because of their frequency is um, quite high, similar to plant lighting. So and ensured that the place is actually usable, the plants are kept alive, but without using high powered illuminance and without having the generally, um, what do you call them? In your face, growth lines, <laughs> let's just say that. Um, a bit like the other wall we showed you earlier. Yeah. Next slide, please. Um, this is just showing light, again, going through the bamboo, and then on the right-hand side, these cracks of light were the uh, important elements, I think, in some of the areas. Again, creating these areas of intrigue and not sure where that light's coming from, but also um, we ensured the detailing was wide enough for if there was any maintenance to people to get their hands in. So I think it's really important, especially these clients want everything to be accessible for maintenance. It was quite a confined space. Everything was quite compact. Um, so introducing little light niches and details like this um, added a sense of depth and made, makes the space feel a lot bigger than what it actually is. Uh, next slide, please. Just an overall of the space, I think you can see it just actually feels quite clean, daylight lit. Um, the plants look amazing at night. We've got up lights going through the plants, create um, dappled light all through the ceiling. You can see a little bit on the floor there. Um, it's just a really nice space and it's in direct contrast to the end of trip we showed you earlier, which has the warm and the ambience. So the two spaces next to each are defined, uh, defined by the colour and the, um, the use of different materials. Different purposes. Yeah. Next, next slide. Um, just if anybody was thinking that that detail on the left cost an absolute fortune, um, it was beautifully detailed by the architects, the beautiful curve. We've just got a high powered linear LED, but what we did do was test it and ensure it wasn't reflected in the mirror. Um, so not all uh, effects have to be, can be highly impactful without being highly um, cost, um, cost, cost effective. Um, the down lights that are lighting the plants there are just these really small, thimbled lights. Um, but again, like I said, we did our research and ensured they were um, suitable for the plant lighting, but without them protruding from the ceiling or consuming tons of power like a standard growth line. Next slide. Um, how do we do what we do? We often do lots of presentations and the question we uh, neglect to advise how this gets implemented, whether it's us or it's another lighting designer. Um, the initial stage is concept. Um, sorry, we're wrapping it up after this. Uh, initial stage is concept design. We get a briefing from you guys, the interior designers architects. We get a briefing from the client. We tailor every single project for the use and for the client's needs. Um, so we get inside, try and get inside the heads of both. Um, from an architectural perspective, we find out where the key focal points are, the key materials and whatnot. Um, we go away, we come back to something like this, which is a concept design. That just shows the ideas of embellishing the texture and where the focal points are going to be in different color temperatures. Um, so the concept design, I guess, um, steer, gets us steering in the right direction to make sure we're all on the same page. Yeah. And speaking to the client, I think we've said it over and over before about the usage of the space and how it will be used and moving from one space to another. It's just really important to get that um, definition from the client. Um, two residencies we're working on, very similar at the minute. One client, we've got once lights everywhere. They've got five different details in one set of shelves. Another um, residence, of direct contrast, they really don't want any light. They just want everything to the walls. We've just got everything moody. It's a little bit more decorative. So we speak to the clients um, and then sure, and one's got artwork, one doesn't like artwork. The artworks are featuring one. So it's really, really important to get in the definition and what's important to the person or to the client. That's the concept phase. Next phase, once this gets approved, uh, we move on to the next slide, please, which is the design documentation. So we translate what you just saw into a technical design. So what we like to do is, um, so we, again, bridging the gap between the engineer and, and you guys, we'll do the lighting plan, we'll circuit all of the lighting. So you can, engineers won't like this, you can reduce their fees because we're doing a portion of their work. So we'll document this. Um, we do lots and lots and lots and lots of details, as you can see on the right hand side. Um, we'll provide that to you in either CAD or Revit so that you don't have to draw it. Again, we're trying to take, or well, you can keep your fees as they are, but we'll give you the details so you don't have to redraw them. We know they're tried and tested. Um, and we issue a specification where we 
as well as many other lighting designers are independent. So we pick from the wide range of hundreds of lighting suppliers out there. Um, we just pick the best fitting for the, for the application whilst keeping budget in mind, obviously. Um, next phase, next slide, phase, next phase. I think this is most important, the most fun part of the job is um, doing construction, but also commissioning is um, us going to site, walls move, ceiling heights move, just a quick phone call and a markup can save a lot of error. Um, so commissioning is us that these aiming to an artwork, believe it or not, that's a beautiful artwork on a project we've been working on with ARM. Um, so there was no light aimed towards all these amazing pieces of artwork they had in. And then on the right hand side, um, showing Monash, Monash uh, Chansui, we've just worked on. So aiming the lights, so the lights were in very specific areas that we need them to be, so we're getting up on the ladders um, safely and ensuring the lights are pointed to where they're supposed to be. So everything's refined, and I think that's the final part of the, yeah. the process. Yeah, it's pointless installing all these wonderful lights, track lights, spotlights, artwork lights, what have you. Um, and for the last 5% of the job, not commissioning it, I guess, misses out on the last 40% of the success of the installation. So commissioning is really important at the end, but we're obviously also there during the construction phase to assist, implement, and work with all the brief that we all cop during the construction phase. Um, so that's how we achieve what we achieve. And next, next slide. slide, which is, thank you all for listening. Um, difficult times. Yeah, thank you. We've got a, so much to cover. Um, we wanted to cover technical, um, CRI, colour temperature, everything, but we kept it to the pretty pictures and I hope you guys enjoy that. That's fine. Thank you very much, uh, Faye and Adam from Glowing Structures. I have a number of questions that have come in over the chat. And I suppose the first one really is about architects and the way that they work with glass. So as you well know, architects do a lot of work with glass. It's moving away from maybe some of the more traditional cladding elements. Um, but not only do we have to worry about things like thermal efficiency, we also have to worry about, uh, I suppose, the issues that reflective the reflective issues that glass presents. So what's the best way to highlight glass filled interiors without creating a lot of additional noise shadow uh, that you know a lot of reflection can deliver? So lighting, we did um, a little bit of restaurant um, about a year ago, we did some testing and it was all about the view. So at night the glass becomes a mirror which creates a lot of problems. So we the proposed to the client to keep any lighting off any vertical surfaces in the background so it did not reflect in the mirror. So during the day, for example, like now we're in daylight and um, doesn't become a problem, but we do have to think about um, different seasons and at night time. So if we had lighting on these shelves, for example, would look fine now. At night time, it would become an instant reflective problem in the windows. And if you were, the, the area is all about the view, you would just see the shelving. So we do take that into consideration and there's ways of lighting the space. And if the light's concealed, then it shouldn't reflect in the light. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite a difficult. Polished surfaces are a really difficult material, whether it's polished marble, glass, coloured glass, what have you. Um, polished, polished materials are quite difficult to work with. I think it's really important, as Faye says, if it's a view or if it's clear glass, you need to be wary to dim down the lights on the interior of an evening so you can see the view outside. Um, avoiding reflection is really important. When we do a cove detail, you can actually point the LED into the cove and reflect around the plaster work to illuminate the glass rather than the light pointing directly to the glass and then you don't get that direct reflection. Um, so we can work with it. We work with Mark Douglas and lots of other glass designers because we love glass as well. But there's ways around, yeah, avoiding that hot spot of reflection. The interesting point I have, and this is one rule I might even get a tattooed on me, you talk about ditching the downlights constantly. That's a new one for us. It is difficult though, because it's, it is hard to achieve when they're so embedded into our sort of daily design lexicon. Uh, you know, you've got clients that are very attached to them, especially in the housing sector. You know, you've got a lot of people that have torn a page out of a magazine and said, I love these downlights. I mean, why are, why are downlights so unliked by designers? Is it because they're usually associated with more mediocre dare I say, sort of DIY projects, or is there a bigger, why are downlights no longer sort of in vogue? I've just um, unmuted you. I'm just going to um, ask you to uh, 
unmute there, Adam, just because there was a little bit of echo. I do apologize. No, he's talking about your pendant. I'm just saying, you don't have any downloads. You've got a beautiful pendant and some lovely candles, and I'm sure that's a lovely light to live by. But um, I think downloads have come to their force because they're easy, um, they're cheap, um, but putting in a, a, a small space, putting in two rows of three downloads is actually a bit of a false economy because you could actually light that space really well with four downloads, one to each wall. So it's not about just not, just not using downloads, it's how they're positioned and where they're pointing. Um, I guarantee you would get a much better effect with four downloads in a little small bedroom rather than six downloads right through the center if you lit all the walls and opened up those spaces. So they're, they're cheap, they're quick and easy to put in. Um, they're just not thought out. And I think like Adam's saying from a budget perspective, um, you know, they just get put in the rows, the, the, the red on the plan, they're all lined up with the services. You cannot light air. Light has to hit something to be um, picked up by the eye. So reduce the ones that are just light in the air and then the floor and the top of your head is your wall and highlight the features. No matter what room you put in them in, whether it's artwork, even a wardrobe door, something that's been thought out, artwork, wardrobe door, um, textured wall. So there's a place for them but maybe not as many as what people think. You get more light from reflective light than you do from a general downline. When presenting concepts to clients, what is the best rendering program to use when communicating the value and the beauty of what the finished product would look like? We use a couple. Yeah, we've toyed with a few different mm. things. We've had, you can do the 3D visualization modeling, whatnot. Um, just putting it out there to our peers in the industry, that's always quite dangerous because the more realistic it is, the more the, the expectations are for it to be exactly like that render. Um, so what we're doing, what we're doing, what the architects are doing is a bit of an art, a bit of a, a, bit of a craft. Um, so we've found often our hand sketches are really good. Um, Photoshop's really good. Um, so we are typically using Photoshop's hand sketches, um, putting a bit of emotion and, and love into it. It's probably a bit more than a computer rendering. Um, computers, we can tweak to do whatever you really want. Um, but I think when you put that emotion into it and, and, and demonstrate that and present it in such a way, I think that resonates, we've found it resonates a lot more um, with the client and you know, it's, it's a personal experience, personal interaction. Yeah. How, how do you feel? Yeah, exactly like Adam's saying. And it also will present sometimes fitness to the client that we're trying to show, like trying to talk about a specific light effect or a fitting on a piece of paper that doesn't work. And I think we're a lot more about verbalization and showing them and talking them through it and making clients comfortable. I think sometimes we might be proposing something that some have never seen before. So actually being able to demonstrate it to them physically is very important. In a question, in Sorry. Oh, no, I was, I was just going to say, just in conscious of time, there's a question from Joe on the chat. And it's an interesting one. And Joe says, what are your thoughts on sunset dimming, specifically related to more residential projects? What's your response to that? Um, I, I think we've got different views. So um, sunset dimming, I didn't mind. When we had halogen, um, that's what they used to do is naturally you could dim the halogen down. We're old enough to remember the halogen. And they would naturally go warm. And I think we've moved on from that and as a designer. We now use different elements uh, as the night scene. So we'll bring joinery into effect, pendants into effect. Um, that's my personal thought. The cost of them and the energy consumption versus the look and the output, I don't think is quite there yet. And I, we have used them in, in commercial. Yeah. Um, I think the idea is, the idea in principle is really good um, to have brighter light during the day as we do now. We've got daylight, that's quite cool. And you know, just uh, natural beasts, as it gets darker, we're used to that warmer color temperature. So in theory, the sunset dim are really good. I think, Joe, it's a great idea and, and, and used in the right application. It can work really well. Um, I think they're still perfecting it from a technical perspective um, to get that outcome that we're after, in my opinion. But yeah, def I, yeah it's a good one. I suppose in closing, when we look to 2020, we've had one hell of a year already. We move into 2021. What's on the horizon in terms of lighting? What emerging trends are you seeing coming out of Europe? What sort of things can we expect to see in 2021 and beyond in your region? What's coming out of Europe? Lighting? Were we well, due we to were, go to Frankfurt? We were supposed to be in Frankfurt two months ago. Yeah. Um, that didn't happen. We usually go to Frankfurt every second year just to stay at the forefront of what's coming out. What we see in Frankfurt two years ago is coming out here in the next two years. So um, we missed the boat with that one. We did. We were in Milan last year. We saw um, a lot of battery-operated lighting. Um, lighting getting smaller. 
Thank you. Um, liking getting smaller. Um, you, most of our projects there, um, again, we don't want to plug specific suppliers because there's lots that have really good fittings, but um, Igazeni were kind of at the forefront where they have really tiny downlights with this amazing effect. You know, at the forum, we put downlights in at six meters, which were 28 mil diameter, and they lit the floor down below. So size miniaturization, efficiency, um, cost is getting better um, from a decorative perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, we've still got our favourites, our little traditionals, but um, yeah. It's, um, I think there's a bit of innovation with the, the magnets um, and also I hate to say it and I'm just going to say in a couple of years, I think I've always steered and I think we've always steered away from solar lights, um, but I think in the next couple of years we will see some, and I'm not saying now because I haven't seen anything quite there yet, but I do think it's a big market and I think some people are jumping on it and it's somewhere that needs a lot of improvement, but I think there's some good things coming out. Great stuff. Right. All right, well, thank you. We might leave it there if that's okay, Adam and uh, Faye from Glowing Structures. If people do want to reach out to you and uh, get in touch and if they've got any questions or want to collaborate with you on any projects, what's the best website uh, to get in touch with you? Glowingstructures.com. Do you want to say I'll, that? I'll, say that, I'll say that in English. It's um, glowing structures with an S at the end. So glowingstructures.com, not .au, .com. No worries, glowingstructures.com, you've heard it here. Well, thank you very much. This is uh, effectively the end of our lean-in session today. A huge thank you to you both, Adam Deguara, Faye Greenhouse from Glowing Structures. Great thank to have you. you with us here at the Institute of Architects, as always. I hope for all of you and all of our frequent leaders that join us that this has been a really fa fascinating session and hope you've got some really good value out of today's session. So that is it for today. As always, I've been Michael Linky, stuck here in the front bedroom at... Uh, um, isolating here in Melbourne, sadly, but I uh, look forward to catching up with you all again on Thursday. So don't forget, on Thursday, 12 noon, my next Lean In session details are on our website as well. So don't forget to register and I'll see you then. Until then, stay safe and look forward to seeing you all very, very soon. Cheers.